Hello and welcome to Start the Beat with Sykes. My name is Sykes and this is my podcast. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank everyone who checked out the last episode. If you're one of those people, I hope you enjoyed the conversation and thanks so much for coming back. But for everyone out there who's new to the show, welcome. Feel free to make yourselves at home. And as always, there's beer, soda, water, coffee in the fridge. Cheers to everyone out there on the internet you know, today. I don't know what it is. Maybe we can get start here. You know, it's it, the 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 creative the creative mind. I find that I overanalyze things. It's like my creativity getting the best of me. I always think of like the worst case scenarios and overanalyze everything instead of just letting things be, which yeah. I, I try to do, which is why I'm still doing the podcast. But yeah, I don't know. I still get those feelings of like, why? Why should I do this? Well, like, is that really when you say you overanalyze it? Is it you just don't like? How do you overanalyze it? Like, what do you mean by like why? Like, I think that you know, sometimes I feel like there isn't anybody listening, but then people hit me up that tell me they listen. I'm like, oh, okay, people are listening. Yeah. I just get in my own head. Like, nothing's ever good enough. You know what uh, I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, you get that. you get a, uh, you know. <laughs> You buy one camera and all of a sudden it's like all I wanted was one camera, right? I just fought for one camera. Then I got one camera. The next thing it's like, well, yeah. I need two cameras now. Two cameras. <laughs> and then I need fuck, you know, it's and then like you got lights. Yeah, nothing got... nothing is ever enough. But I, you know, this less about me, more about you. How do you deal with just the struggles of the the, the negatives of being creative? Let's start there. Because it's there's no reason for us to do this shit other than our own selfish desire. Right? Yeah. Um I mean, I think I think expression is a necessary component to being a happy person. I feel like I feel like oh, that's deep. Yeah, like I I uh, I I don't know if I would write it off so easily as to say it is like a selfish desire as much as as a necessary thing that I think we all have to do. And I think when people don't adequately express themselves, or if they don't, um, if they don't. If they don't take the time to examine their experience as a person and the things around them and how they feel about it or say things they want to say, it's it leads to, I think, a lot of the unhappiness and toxic behaviors we see around us because whether it's people holding them down or people holding themselves down, you know, like I just feel like it's a it's a pretty necessary thing for all of us that we should try to do, you know. So it's like, I mean, follow those threads, you know, and sometimes they go nowhere and sometimes they go a, a richer life you know but it's like what's important is that you tried you know what i mean like what's important is that you even bothered you know because it's better to bother and fail i think than to like never even try to do it and then just be like you know 65 someday and be like well what would have happened if i tried that you know at least you know what happened when you tried it you know yeah like what's wrong with that you know i mean and I mean, you're you're doing a podcast for a long time, and I think if you find any sort of audience and it matters to them at all, then it's worth it, right? Like, totally. I think that again, I get in my own head a lot about like what my expectations of this whole thing are, and I know that it's like really, really absurd, which is why I am still doing a podcast. I always have to kind of like consistently put myself in check and yeah. be like be thankful for what you have and be thankful for the circle of people that you have around yeah. you because also it's you like gotta. you know very hypocritical in the sense where you know if a podcast maybe like you know if something i put out doesn't get a lot of attention i feel bad in some sort of a way but i feel like i've been like crafted by society to feel bad in that Definitely, way yeah and also on the flip if like three people text message me at once, it's like the end of the world because I don't. I kind of want to be left alone like too. Right, yeah. So it's like this weird. Like I want people to pay attention to what I'm doing, but I also want people to leave me alone. Yeah, but if people leave me alone, I feel bad because I feel like they're not paying attention to me. It's this weird vicious cycle that I think a lot of it is just been manufactured by you know our ding dong cell phones and yeah. everything else, or at least the way that we use the cell phone, not the cell phone itself. You know. Yeah, I mean, definitely however you want to consider that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and it's, I mean, there's a entire culture of always on attention, which I think is also pretty toxic. You know, like you need to be able to understand yourself and like time by yourself. You know, but you don't want it to be that way. And 
I mean, I don't want to get too insane with how I think about things, but I mean, why do the people who make these things, they wouldn't want us to not be on them all the time because they need to put the ads in front of us. You know what I mean? Yeah. So this culture gets manufactured for us all to like always be on, but you know, you turn it off sometimes, but don't be like express yourself, like put yourself out there in the ways that matter to you. Not, you know, like if you don't want people bothering you all the time, just don't like, you know, you can be alone. It's okay not to respond for a while, you know? Like, yeah. It's okay to do that because you need that time. But, I mean, expressing yourself creatively through, like, a band or through, like, a movie or through a podcast, like, that's a different type of thing, you know? That's a different way of, like, communicating with society mm-hmm. or putting yourself out there, you know? The other thing that I've had to, like, really become familiar and comfortable with and recognizing is just, like, how niche of a demographic what I do is for. That's important. You yeah. know, this kind of shit isn't for everybody. Is important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think a lot of people like to have these like self analyzing conversations where you kind of like beat yourself up for the better, which that's not what the show always is, but yeah. I do do that a lot. And I'm also doing it with like creatives in the Pittsburgh PA area. And it's such a small fucking bubble. So it's like, how many people should yeah. I expect to really be on board with this in the first place? No, that's true. I mean, that's really true. Um, healthy <laughs> expectations is important in anything in life, you know, like having a healthy, like a reasonable, rational expectation, you know, because our expectations will always get the better of us because, you know, like it's always, whether it's like, you know, cavemen looking into the dark, like what's out there, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you're going to fantasize anything. You're you're in an open body of water and you have no idea what's underneath it. You're always going to think it's always like the biggest worst shark, but it could be a bunch of algae, you know what I mean? But having a having a tangible like expectation, like you're saying, like it's healthy to like talk yourself down and be like, you know, this is very niche. Like this sort of conversation on its own is very niche, but then... Like, I'm doing it for a specific demographic and a specific geographic area, you know? Like, you're right. Like, you might not get as much. But you, at the same time, you are offering that to those people when perhaps no one else is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So. Maybe, you know, know, I'm very, I think I'm, like, criminally humble at times. Yeah. Because also, you know, in this realm of arts and entertainment, dog eat dog or however you want to put it you kind of got to put yourself out there you got to be on a pedestal you kind of have to be a little a, a little arrogance will get you a long way yeah. in this realm and i'm just a not delusion that, not that fucking person yeah and i find it like really hard it's like over the past few years of my life i've really like come into being like oh yeah like i grew up an introvert i am an introverted kid but all of my activities are incredibly extroverted activities playing in bands doing podcasts some into things that involve other people yeah but it like needs to be the right kind of people in order for me to be comfortable otherwise yeah. i'm still like i can relate in my shell yeah for sure i can relate so you know with you and your creative background you said that you started doing like cartooning you said you yeah, were drawing i did it well i always wanted to do film and, and video and movies i've always wanted to do that but um i before, when I was in high school, I grew up, I didn't grow up in Pittsburgh. I grew up near Johnstown, right? So I grew up in a small mountain town before the digital evolution or, you know, revolution. I mean, because I graduated in 03, right? So like, you know, this stuff wasn't, I couldn't, you couldn't just go to Best Buy and buy like a DSLR for like a thousand bucks. that looks awesome, right? Yeah, yeah. It was like the idea of you got to buy film and you got to do this and you got to do that. Like to do things back then, like, even though we had digital video, it was you know, it's dog shit or whatever. Like, oh yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So, um, you couldn't really do it. So I, I let my parents had always told me you could do whatever you want to do. It wasn't my family, but you know, the school system around me or like the world around me made me believe that that was not a possible dream unless I wanted to go to New York or LA, which I was not ready for that sort of change. Right. And I just drew as a hobby. So I ended up settling for a hobby and be like, well, it's, Better than working in an office somewhere, you know? And it just didn't work. It just, I was, I was pretty, I had a webcomic in the mid 2000s, which was a very popular time for webcomics. And I had a following and I was doing pretty well with it, honestly, for where I was at in my age. And I don't know, it just not, it just wasn't working for me. You know, even when I was first to go to art school, you know, I didn't go to school for film and it just didn't work for me. I just, 
felt like it i needed like i needed the um the movement and the sound and like the the kinetic energy of film versus just like drawing pictures you know what i mean doing cartoon and then being a cartoonist and just doing like this like darkly funny web comic thing that was probably just the rip off of John and Vasquez, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, like sure. really like, um, like it was like very much like Jimmy Hewlett's art from gorillas and stuff. Yeah. Tank girl. And John and Vasquez is like squee comic. Like it looked a lot like the mix of those two things. So I just knew I wasn't being true to myself, you know, underneath it all. So I gave it up, you know, and I felt really lost for like three or four years. Just sort of like, what the, what am I doing, dude? And I got involved in film in Pittsburgh through the 48 hour film project which you may be familiar with, may not. Yeah, I um, a lot of people seem to participate in it. I'm a big advocate for it because I think it is a good place for anybody who, you know, somebody's listening to this and they're like, oh, I always wanted to try it out. I mean, dude, just follow their Facebook page, go to their meetup events, like get involved that way. Because I met a guy named Ed Wong who showed me the ropes on set and then I started helping with their 48 team and I met a guy who was also helping and didn't know anybody named Jeff Smee. Uh, his brother is Greg Smee from uh, Woman. It's like a band in Pittsburgh. I don't know. Some people are aware of it. Some people yeah. haven't. Um, and I met him, and we, like, hit it off really well, and we became, like, creative partners. And, like, by a year later, we were, like, we got second place. We got first place in the competition. Like, he's gotten best cinematographer. I've got best director. We, like, really turned things around quickly together because our first movie had no credits, like, no credit music, and the second one was, like, second place because we had such synergy as creative people. And then my friend Matt, who I've known for 20 years, helps me write the stuff, Matt Schultz, and he was part of it. So it's like I just found people who, like, resonated with me, you know? Yeah. And it's just like I just – I really felt like that was validation that what I was doing was a decent move because, like, I was seeing tangible results, you know? But even without it, I still would have pursued it because it felt right, you know? Because I'm like – I'm like a person who is, like, eternally trapped in my youth, like, I'm always looking for that feeling of when, like, the world was new and, like, things seemed possible. You know, it's tough in 2021 to feel that way. <laughs> totally. <laughs> right? <laughs> totally. And, like, going back to, you know, the way that I feel and all of those beginning points that we made at the top of the conversation, I think back on when I was happiest as a creative person, and a lot of it is that, like, post-high school, just figuring it out, I didn't know anybody in the music scene. I didn't really know anybody in the art world or the film world, all of these, like, you know, yeah. these areas of things that I was interested in. But I just did shit with my friends to do it. To do and it. there was, like, we had, like, MySpace, but, like, you logged on it every other day. It wasn't, yeah. like, a, a thing that's buzzing in your pocket all yeah. the time. It wasn't anywhere near what social media is now. So, like, I had time to just kind of get lost with my friends and, like, live and exist in this small bubble. And, like, yeah. I was happier no, I agree. in that in that realm of just being in this place where the outside world doesn't matter as much even if i like tell myself now that the outside world doesn't matter part of it still does it's still like been baked into my dna over the past decade yeah of like giving more of a shit about what strangers think of me i don't know what the fuck that is yeah i mean to, to some extent it's true in that to be ultimately successful you do have to find an audience that you appeal to <laughs> yeah, you, know what I mean? yeah. you know what i mean like that's, uh -huh. that's a like a to, to be successful in a, I guess, objective sense, like, you know, whatever you define success as, I guess, but if be financially successful via your hobby or your, your love would be, you have to find an audience, you know? But, um, yeah, I mean, I agree though, because I had a period of life where I was back with my friends back home, uh, hanging out in our friend's attic, like after I dropped out of college before I went to art school, where all we did was just like write and brainstorm potential stories. And like, it really was nothing other than just thinking of ideas but it was so fun you know like and i still value that time more than a lot of periods of my life you know i miss it a lot you know for sure